I teach about 600 students about human sexuality. And I'm honest to say that particularly today, I'm really happy to see people over 21. <laughs> That's particularly appropriate for what I'm going to talk about, but also I have to tell you an anecdote. I, I uh, give a few media experiences in this, in this uh, class, and one of them has men talking about their bodies. Most of the men in there are young bodies. And there's one man who's not so young. He takes off his shirt, and he's overweight and out of body tone. And the entire audience goes, ew. There's a part of me that's personally insulted. Um, and then there's the bad part of me that says, just you wait <laughs> in my head. <laughs> But then I think, no, I'm going to change their mind. I'm going to change our mind. I'm going to talk about what it is to be older and have sex and passion and relationships that count for a much longer time than we've ever been given in history. And they're going to look forward to this point, even if they can't quite imagine that right now. So I am going to talk about the generation that brought you a couple revolutions is going to bring you one more. You remember the boomers? Many, how many of you are boomers? Not bad. How many of you not sure? <laughs> how many of you don't remember? <laughs> then you are. <laughs> but in any case, if you were born between 1945 and 64, that's a generous group, you're a boomer. And you may remember, there's a, that's the population lump, but the cultural group, the leading edge, is uh, about 65, 66. How would I know? Um, that is my age, so I know what that edge was like. And I remember the first revolution. The first revolution was essential to the rest of them. It was the contraceptive revolution. It was the right to have choice over whether or not to bear a child. It was expressed in either legal abortion or better and better contraceptives. And that let women be able to make some choices that they hadn't been able to make before. The second revolution was, in fact, continuing from that for women. That little illustration over there is the feminine mystique, which kind of preceded the boomers. But it set the stage for women's revolution of, of identity, uh, women's sexual revolution, the gay revolution, revolutions of sexual authenticity, reimagining who they could be, and asking for equal treatment and equal rights. So it was extremely important about questioning whether marriage was the right thing, whether monogamy was the right thing. It reviewed everything. Everything was on the table. And of course, they say, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> the third revolution, though, is the one I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> and that is, I was looking for words to call it, like the third third or um, the prime timers, or the silver spring. Um, I do like the term that AARP uses. Um, I actually am the first AARP ambassador of love, sex, and relationships. <laughs> I am so thrilled. It is so right for me at this time of my life. and. I think that it is this revolution of life reimagined, of that third third being just as potent and passionate and as worthwhile as any other third of our lives. Imagine what it's going to be like. Let me help you. <laughs> it's a new normal that we're going to be looking at. I think, try and think of your, of your parents um, or the setup that maybe the people in their 80s and 90s and se late 70s are going through now. My grandmother, I could never see my grandmother pumping iron. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, maybe cooking for us in the middle of the night, but it wouldn't have been a vision. Her, her vision of what her role was as she got older was a very traditional role um, of, of being a grandparent, um, of taking care of her children and their children. We were not... Um, we were not seeing her as a person who had her own life to live. It was all about us. And, and that's kind of the way that 
she and my grandfather saw it too. There was no sense that once my grandfather died that my grandmother would remarry. And there was no sense that there was even that sex or passion or a new rela relationship would be even um, seemly. In fact, I don't know if you remember, some of you are old enough to do so, Playboy magazine. I know you read the articles. And um, <laughs> there used to be a cartoon in it called Little Annie Fanny. And there was an older woman in it who had breasts down to here, and she was very brandy, and she was an object of derision, really. Well, of course, that's something we need to change. Why? How can we do it? Well, I think we have a generation who have been changing the rules and the perspective and the frame all of our lives, and we still want the full tilt boogie. We have no idea that this is ever going to have to stop. I suppose it will, but we want to die doing what we love, which is what we were doing all along. Now we've got technology to help us, which I'll go on a little bit more. We have ways of meeting people at every section of our life. Online dating's fastest growing group are people over 55 in, in all the online sites. We have the medical magic that is being funded by the fruits of our labor over what was, we were very lucky to have a very good economy most of our lives. That was very lucky in retrospect. But listen to Lee Hood earlier. This is, we are having the benefit of things that are gonna help us stay longer, stronger, more. And a heavy divorce rate, even people 50 and 60, 70 years old, does ensure a new supply of partners. <laughs> so, <laughs> you gotta look at the bright side, you know? <laughs> so if we're looking at 40, 30 years of additional health, of the same ambitions, um, of people who believe that a late life marriage is not a ludicrous thing to do, um, if we're not going to make any compromises, you're going to see a third stage that you've never seen before. We now expect a life cycle of more than 80 years. I mean, that's ordinary. That can be expected. You could, in fact, be seeing people um, who will be living 20 years, even longer than that. So if you could imagine, if you left your relationship or looked for a new one at 60, you could be together 30 years. That's not a trivial amount of time. That's us. <laughs> Actually, that's me. <laughs> but that's another story. So boomers are looking for the fountain of youth. <laughs> and we want the technology, and we're looking for all of the kinds of ways to live our life that will help us to do it. We don't really think we'll last forever, but we want to last well while we last. And I think that means we're very in interested in health, the growth of all the kinds of diets and health stores and uh, various kinds of, of workouts. If you go to a gym now, you'll see a lot of older people there. We're used to it now. That wouldn't have been that way 20 years ago. We want to be educated, elder hostels, God, I hate the word elder, and we never, never, never use the word senior. We're looking for new titles that are vibrant in the same way that we want to travel the world and live a very full life. And that includes sex and romance. It does not exclude it. It was always part of the good life for us before. We want it to continue to be part of the good life for us now. In medicine, the, the star ones you know about are Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. They are singularly responsible for men's, pardon the word, extension of their sexual life. <laughs> I didn't rehearse that, but it was so right. Um, <laughs> I do think that we still have to come to terms with the idea of older people being sexual. In the United States, we are so prudish. The Cialis ad has one person in a bathtub and the other person in a bathtub looking at the sunset on a beach. I can't even imagine the marketing people who thought that went up. But the interesting thing is that in the European ad of Cialis, they're both in the same tub, <laughs> which I think makes a lot of sense, personally. <clears throat> there are all kinds of drugs that are coming out of, um, on the market. Intense is supposed to give you various kinds of tingles that'll wake up 
women's sexuality a little bit, you know, higher. They're his and her lubricants. And not only are they coming out, but they're now being sold in Walmart. I mean, this would have been beyond our imagination even a few years ago. There is a demand for these products, and the, the, um, the vibrator market has gone... S <laughs> Everything I want to say is... <laughs> Let's just say they're selling extremely well. And we're, we're getting the body parts to do all this. Artificial knees, artificial everything, you know, a new heart. I mean, we can do all the same positions. Um, these are really, because those things will take you down. <laughs> they will. You know, have great ambitions, you've got to have knees. So, <laughs> just being practical here. So we're talking about something that affects our whole culture. We're not just talking about a few people. The figures up there tell the story. In just 10 years, look at the number of people in this age group, and the fastest growing age group is between 60 and 64. So this isn't just about a lot more younger people in the middle age. It is meaning that we're having a lot of people who are making these demands, changing the culture, and as the baby boom has changed it before, we will change it now. So how does that affect our love and sex choices? Well, this lady here could either stay with this great looking gentleman over there. She's looking. Or she can go for a younger model. <laughs> She's got a lot of time, you know. Or somebody her parents wouldn't have approved of before, but now she can do what she likes. They're dead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Or she can get really, you know, get a cabana boy and, um, you know, maybe, maybe Kuchar, who knows, maybe he's on the market. Or she can get another way of life. She can choose another person. She can get in a same gender situation. She can have choices because she's now inhabiting fully her adulthood with her choices up to her and she's not living for other people. She's living for herself. I'll give you two stories. Let's take Howard. Howard was married for, um, Howard wouldn't mind saying, Howard's my uh, ex-brother-in-law, we're still pretty friendly, and Howard was married um, for, what, I don't know, 30 years, had four kids, um, marriage that wasn't doing so well for him, and he was very curious about his sexuality, and thought a lot about it in his youth, but he kind of had put that aside, and then he goes online, and he goes and finds one of these targeted sites. Married men looking for other married men. You can find anything on the internet. You want to find married men looking for other married men who only like brown shoes, you can find them. Howard found the love of his life. Robert had to go through the very uh, unpleasant and hurtful transition of getting out of his marriage, telling his kids, making Robert part of the family. Um, and indeed, this is the way he sees his next 30 going. Then there's Dee. Dee had a wonderful marriage for 40 years. Maybe I'm shorting that a little. It was a very long marriage. And it was such a good marriage that after she was through a couple years of grieving, she said, I want to meet somewhere else again. So she flew to, do a, to attend a workshop on relationships and online dating that I was doing. She was having trouble with the technology. Went over and helped her kind of fill out profiles and stuff. She met some people. Then she met somebody through um, um, a friend of hers, their father, they fell in love. They now visit each other in their assisted living places. She's 83, he's 86. They just went to Sicily last year. She's not giving an inch. You meet Dee, you'd know that this is a totally vibrant person and her ability for passion and romance are only stopped if she thought they should stop and she didn't think they should stop and so she's now again with a deeper love than she thought she could ever feel again. This is someone who loved her, her, her husband who died. Why shouldn't she love again? What are the social impacts of this change? Some of them are actually fairly um, sobering to think about. Um, first of all, it does mean that we probably have to keep ourselves up the whole nine yards. <laughs> I mean, if, we're, if, people, if we can be left in our 70s and 80s, we better keep it together. So indeed, there is a lot of plastic surgery um, there is 
I just did a study where there was only about 3% of people who had plastic surgery. And then I, in the study, we asked if it was free, would you do it? 65% <laughs> said they would. So uh, if the cost goes down, we're all going to look the same. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a little scary. Um, <coughs> we, we want more ability to sustain our sexual lives. We are working on our physical um, ability to have these longer lives in, in better shape. But I think the more sobering or interesting kinds of thing to think about is imagine if your parents are now making new alliances that may change the transfer of wealth, that may change the ability for babysitting, that may change, in a sense, what you imagined their lives would be for you at their very old age. Indeed, the kind of things that these changed, all the moving parts of a relationship and of a family system, it's not that they're bad, but they're very unexpected. Children really have an awful time seeing their parent fall in love again. It's not an easy transition. And if they're making their decisions for themselves, they may make different decisions than they thought their parent would ever make. You get a lot more happy people, but you have to figure out the family system all over again. So, like every other part of the baby boom's existence, this one will too be making up the rules as they go along and changing our culture as they do it. It's still drugs, sex, pardon me, it's still sex, drugs, rock and roll, just uh, different drugs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.